isn't he wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful, I have seen his effort and Again, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the testimonies that have been brought forth. Just praising you and giving you all the glory and honor. And just thank you for these people that have been healed and with your loving, touching hand and just to uplift them. Lord, we give you all the praise for our good health as we take this offering. Meet the needs of our church. We thank you for that. Amen. Uh, we don't really have a special so much uh, tonight. Those who are on the uh, music roster, you know how fluid that is. It, it changes, and people are changing here to this one, to that one, to this one, and, and sometimes it gets where there's a night where that wasn't taken care of, and, and that's my fault usually. But um, I just want to share a poem, and, and that'll be it. That's about what we have time for. Uh, it's uh, a poem called Believe Good Things of God, written by a man, uh, William Huff. You may know, the, you may know the, the poem. When in the storm it seems to thee that he who rules the raging sea is sleeping, still on bended knee, believe good things of God. When thou hast sought in vain to find the silver thread of love entwined in life oft tangled well, Believe good things of God. And should he smite thee till thy heart is cracked beneath the bruising smart, e'en while the bitter teardrops start, believe good things of God. Tis true, thou canst not understand the dealings of your father's hand, but trusting what his love has planned, believe good things of God. He loves you in that love Confide, unchanging, tested, true, and tried. And let now joy or grief be tied. Believe good things of God. For this you know you cannot raise your thoughts too high as spread above the earth, the sky. So do his thoughts, thy thoughts. Believe good things of God. 
in spite of what your eyes behold, in spite of what your fears have told, still to his precious promise hold. Believe good things of God. For know that what thou canst believe, thou wilt in his good time receive. You cannot have his love conceived. Believe good things of God. Amen. Thank you, John. We appreciate that. The poem is uh, valuable to us, not only because it's based upon the personal and precious promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to us, that he works all things out for good to them who love him. But that actually is our experience day by day, moment by moment. And again, it's part of the reason why you are here tonight. We have an awful lot to be thankful for. Let's thank God and then let's ask the Spirit of God to prep our hearts for the reception of his word tonight. Heavenly Father, you've uh, graced us and blessed us tonight. Thank you. We love the testimonies of your people and Part of the reason why we do is because it reflects on the comments that we've just made, the observations we have just made. You, you really do um, love us. You really do care about us, and you really do work things out for good. And uh, for that, we are glad. And uh, Lord, um, we, we love the fact that, and we know we need to be careful with our feelings, but we love the fact that we actually experience these things, this is our personal testimony to one another. It's our personal testimony to the lost world. And it is our personal praise to you, God, uh, from whom all blessings flow. You continue to afford us every reason to live out our lives for our Savior. And you continue to afford us every reason and give us every motive for being obedient to your word, to your teachings. And that certainly comes into play with our study in James. So again, two things. One, that you would turn the light on for us. And two, that you would find our hearts cultivated, ready to receive your truth, which means that we not only have understanding of it, but where we are prayerfully and with devotion to God, and certainly with dependence upon Christ, committed to living out your truth. That's our prayer. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> our study in James continues. We are working our way through the first six verses of James chapter 5, where James, on behalf of God, is issuing a warning to the rich. I love the dynamic of our text, uh, and, and you, I think, will understand uh, me when I express the following. Uh, there, there is a sense in which none of us would view ourselves as being rich, and uh, you, you would think because that is a practical reality that we are not rich, that this text has very little application to us. I'm wondering again tonight why you came. And perhaps, uh, perhaps it, it warrants our, our leaving before God speaks. And yet, again, the dynamic of the text, a whole lot of happening. It's almost always that way. That's part of the reason, by the way, you and I, you, can study through a text and be greatly blessed and greatly instructed, thinking that you have captured the depth of the meaning of the text only down the road to discover that there's a whole lot of other angles to look at the text. Much more truth that God desires to reveal to you. And that certainly is the case here with James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. On the one hand, James is clearly talking about the wicked rich. We are, by the grace of God, not a part of them. And yet we have ringing in our ear the soft voice of the Savior who has convinced us that according to his definition, we all are rich. It's amazing. We are, through the text, again, I'm re referencing the dynamic of it. One time, uh, at one time, you uh, understand that James and God are talking about a group that you 
absolutely are not a part of, and yet inherent in those very words are principles that couldn't be any more applicable to you and to me. I love that. It's a testimony of the, of, of the livingness of the word of God. And it really reminds us, and this is a broad and good observation for us, it doesn't matter where you're reading, it doesn't matter who God is talking to, you can be certain that at least by way of principle that the Spirit of God will be knocking on the door of your heart and reminding you of vital truths. So I see that. I, you know, I, I, I continue to devote myself through this, not only study, but to devote myself. I, I'm often reading through James, even from my personal devotions. I have read, it'd be interesting, I don't count, it'd be interesting to, uh, to know how many times I've read through James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And again, this dynamic, you, you know, one time you're certain that this is a group that's far removed from you, and, and then the very next moment you know that God is absolutely talking to you and reminding you again of vital truths and, and, and significant and important principles. James is issuing on behalf of God a warning to the rich. Our ears are open because according to Christ's definition, we are rich. And yet, especially tonight, we will see, and there's been a continuation of this, especially tonight, we will see that James' warning is primarily to uh, the wicked rich, those who have trusted in their riches rather than trusting in the living God. So I say all that to you to help you to appreciate and to keep in mind the amazing dynamic that we have here in these verses. Let's read them together. You follow along as I read James 5, 1 through 6. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept by, back by fraud, they cry. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure. You have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. It's clear even from a cursory reading of these verses that what James is warning the rich of is the coming of divine judgment relates a little bit even to some of the testimonies that we heard tonight. And I, every time I think about divine judgment, I well think of many things, including Christ's warning that was so succinctly and um, explicitly clear as he turned to um, the Pharisaical Jew and said, flee the wrath to come. And whenever I think about that, and of course these are coming from the, 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 these words are coming from the word of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. These words are coming from the one who is in his very nature and essence truth, John 14, 6. God can not lie. And this is the Son of God, the eternally begotten Son of God. This is God in the flesh. It's the second personage of the Trinity. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, if he warns us of judgment coming, you can count on the fact that it's coming. And as I rehearse that, I think of the worldling and his response to such. And I realize that some have done a disservice in regard to this. I've often referenced, you know, the person Hollywood has really captured this, you know, a half-naked uh, man with big billboards on both the front and back of him standing on the corner and probably, uh, you know, even intoxicated and saying judgment is coming, judgment is coming. And, and oh, how the world mocks that. Problem is, judgment is coming. That's the problem. 
and uh, even Brother Jerry in his uh, testimony touched on that. We, um, we, we have to continue to warn, but it needs to come from a life. It needs to come from a life that is built on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. It needs to come from a testimony that, is, that consistently sets forth Christ. It, it, it needs to come from a heart that is beating for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, fortunately, the worldling from time to time will listen to such a testimony. Here's James, he's warning the wicked rich of divine judgment. We, we know that it's judgment, not only even from a cursory reading, but uh, whenever we come across the, the word fire, there is a good chance that the, that is a symbolic reference of judgment. And of course, you see that in verse 3. As you and I take a closer look at the text, it reveals that James actually has two kinds of judgment in mind. Maybe... Um, Better to say two stages of judgment. Um, and the first stage has already come. This ought to warn us. By the way, we often, we have been belaboring the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that physical things are winding down and wearing out. That has been divinely imposed, and there's a divine purpose behind that. For the child of God, it certainly includes this idea, a good reminder that this world is not our home, we're simply passing through. But also to the child of God, and then subsequently to the worldling, it, it, it is a reminder that we are responsible for, before God, that uh, the day is coming when we're going to stand before God. And, of course, that principle is applicable to any and all, both sinner and saint, although you and I continue to rejoice in the work of Christ in our lives and paving the way for us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we will not be standing uh, in God's divine judgment against sin because it's been cared for completely and fully by the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. But even the child of God will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account to him in regard to the decisions that we have made, the choices we have made in life, the directions we have taken, and the way that we have responded to um, one another, and the, wa the way in which we have handled the, the, the word of God, um, not only again knowing, but living it out as James petitions us. So there's actually two stages to the judgment. There is a partial present judgment in the form of the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Physical things are winding down and wearing out. Um, by the way, I am inserting here very quickly that the second law of thermodynamics is part of the divine curse on sin. Sometime down the road here, probably not as long as what you might think, we will be getting to the curse in our study in Genesis. Adam and Eve are about to sin. They're about to succumb to the temptation uh, of the tempter. And uh, God is uh, going to institute uh, the, the curse on creation. I don't want you to misunderstand. I know you know this. I want you to know that I know it as well. We, we sin. It, it, you know, the curse, it, it comes at the hand of God, the sovereign hand of God. In other words, uh, God wasn't taken by surprise in regard to all of these things, and the curse certainly doesn't supersede God. It, it comes at the hand of God, but I don't want you to misunderstand we sinned, it's our responsibility. Although the curse has been divinely imposed, and we know that from many texts, including Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, the fact of the matter is the curse is our fault. Sometimes we need to just go back to our childhood terminology. It's my fault. Theologians would express it possibly a little bit differently. So there is a present partial judgment in the form of the second law of thermodynamics. And we, James emphasizes this 
present partial judgment in verse 2 and verse 3a I am reading. Verse 2 and verse 3a. Your riches are, present tense, corrupted. Your garments are, present tense, moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is, present tense, cankered. Again, the second law of thermodynamics. And we noted that uh, the second law of thermodynamics unfolds equally among both sinners and the saints. So James, in verse 2, in the first part of verse 3, emphasizes the present partial judgment. And then like that, like that, rats, like that, just like that, he moves from the present partial judgment to a future full and final judgment that you and I know ultimately culminates with the great white throne judgment that is delineated and discoursed in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 and which ultimately results in hellfire. You remember verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, divine is judgment is coming. Man may and does mock, but that doesn't change the reality and the truth of the matter. And by the way, I've noted with you in regard to, to mocking, the world's mocking, I, I, I am certain that even that is an expression of the fact that down deep they know that it's true we do have something to work with in regard to the worldling, even the one who mocks. Take a look at, uh, again at verse 3. I'm reading the verse in its entirety now. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be, notice, present partial judgment, verse 3a, and then like that, James transitions from present partial judgment to future when he says, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. James, I, I just... Again, continue to stand amazed at James, uh, what, a, what a master teacher he has become. I, I wonder who his family is. I wonder what kind of influences he's had in his life. And, of course, he is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, as you know. We, we, we noted, um, so, so again, let me be clear. Sorry, I'm rambling just a little bit. James starts out by emphasizing this present partial judgment. He speaks of our gold and silver that is rusting and cankered. And then he quickly transitions to a future judgment and he informs them that the day is coming when the way that they have handled their riches will actually testify uh, against them. We noted, again, by way of principle, that that has application to us, although this judgment, we're not going to be there because of the gracious and merciful work of Christ in our lives, the fact of the matter is the principle is very much applicable. And although you and I are not going to be at the great white throne judgment, we will be at the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ will be asking us and evaluating and talking to us about the way that we handled the things that he gave us, the things that he entrusted to our care. And in that day, even for the saint, although that isn't, James' primary emphasis here, in that day, even for the saint, our riches will testify either, either for or against us. Simply stated, and this is even more fully true for, this, for the wicked rich, if we've acquired it properly, if we've acquired it legally, and if we have used it for God's glory and for the good of others, then it will testify for us, but... If, on the other hand, we have accumulated it with improper motive, 
if we've had this strong desire to be rich, if we have lusted and coveted in regard to physical things, if our hearts have not been right, if, it, if we have sought things in order to consume them upon our lusts, which James earlier warned us in chapter 4 and verse 3, then our things will actually testify against us. I, I want to care about that. I, 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 I want to change. I, I want to not be ashamed before the Lord Jesus Christ in that day. So again, these things are so very much applicable to me. But James is expressing a gravity in regard to the wicked rich, and we especially see that in, in the words here in verse 3, and I'm quoting, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. I have an interesting contemplation for you, and especially jives again with some of the testimonies we we heard. Uh, Zane Hodges is a Dallas Theological Seminary guy. I have a number of his works that are valuable to me. He sees here in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and specifically and particularly in this phrase, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire, he, he sees a prophetical es eschatological reference. He sees in the word, shall eat your flesh as it were fire, the nuclear contamination that the prophet Zechariah speaks of in his book. I'm going to take you there in just a minute, but one, one further prep. Zechariah, we're about to read, uh, speaks of a plague. It's interesting how the prophets, we know this well, they not only spoke from their own personal experience, but again, because they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, they, they certainly wrote of things that uh, they had very limited understanding of. We often see that with the prophets. And uh, Zechariah speaks of a future plague. We even know contextually when it's going to take place. It takes place at the end of the tribulation period. Again, uh, through testimony, the tribulation period was referenced tonight. It takes place at the end of the tribulation period. It takes place when all of the armies of the world have got, gathered together in the Valley of Megiddo. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. And Zechariah, especially with a 21st century view, Zechariah uses, uh, uses terms that absolutely make us think of atomic radiation. This plague strikes the armies gathered together at Armageddon. They have gathered together at Armageddon ultimately to fight against, guess who? Jerusalem, the Jew, Israel. And God steps in, the Lord Jesus Christ. No, listen, he literally steps in. But we have an action that takes place, and again, uh, Hodges uh, sees uh, a connection between our text in James 5, 1 through 6, and, and uh, Zechariah. You ready to turn? You curious? Zechariah, it's the second uh, to the last book in the Old Testament. Minor prophet, chapter 14. Take a look. It's an interesting read. I'm not going to push or um, belabor, but a very interesting read. Zechariah 14, beginning with verse 12, reading through the 15th verse. And at the end, you'll be surprised of something especially. Zechariah 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh, notice the depiction of language here, their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes, it's not a pretty picture, folks. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. By the way, out of all the commentators that we've consulted in regard to verse 12 in particular, I have not found a conservative commentator yet who dubs what we just read as being figurative in language. 
I'm reading verse 12 again. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor and Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem and the wealth, this is the curious thing here, and the wealth of all the heathen, you see the tie to J James? And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together. Guess what? Their gold and their silver and Zechariah even mentions their clothing. Here is the rich, well off with gold, silver, and apparel, and guess what? It doesn't cut it in the last day. Again, verse 14, And Jude also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and apparel in great abundance, and so shall be the plague of the horse and of the mule and of the camel and of the ass and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. Wow, talk about amazing destruction coming not at the hands of man, but at the hands of the Son of God. Man, and by the way, and again it relates to testimony, man has created all of these different things using the elements of the earth, and so we talk of, and some even fear of atomic bombs and stuff like that. I will tell you this, the creator of the universe doesn't need to have a bomb in his hand to do exactly what we would anticipate would happen if such a bomb went off. So I thought I, that was kind of interesting, and I, I will uh, leave that uh, with you. But it certainly, um, at least potentially, throws some added light on James' last statement at the end of verse 3. Would you take a look? Our time's almost gone. I have to let you go. We're going to have to, believe it or not, actually come back to this phrase. James says, Ye have heaped treasure together for the last day. You see the irony, right? You don't really need for me to even express this. James has the rich, the wicked rich in mind. They have accumulated great wealth, thinking that, will, that it will somehow help them in the end, when in reality such riches, as we've already identified, will actually witness against them. More to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our study in James and oh, how practical it is. And I tried to express this at the beginning and probably didn't do a good job, but what an amazing dynamic we have here. There are times when we think of no one but the wicked rich, and yet as you warn them through the apostle James, you do so with various principles that couldn't be any more applicable to us. We certainly are not fearing the great white throne judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ has cared for the punishment and judgment of our sin. And yet we know full well that the day will come when we'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account to him as to how we've chosen to live our lives and specifically how we have handled the things that you've entrusted to our care. We will answer for our stewardship. And oh God, we want to be good stewards. We want to be, as the Apostle Paul petitions, we want to be faithful stewards. And in contrast to the wicked rich here, and we'll say more about it next time, the Lord willing, as they accumulate this wealth and the sad irony, they're, they're banking on this, thinking that it's going to help them when it actually in the end testifies against them. Again, you have and will continue to encourage our hearts that it's possible for us to use physical things that do not last in such a way so that they result in things that do. What a great thing. Help us to fully embrace it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hearing these things, how shall we then live? Let's stand and 
and turn to 516. Give up your best to the master using the much that he has given each one of us for his glory. Let's sing verse 2 of 516. Give up your best to the blood. Brother Bob to please close us in a word of prayer. Loving Father, we bow again tonight in your presence. First of all, to thank you for coming to meet with us once again. It's a great privilege to come into your house, to have our pastor open the precious book and give to us the words that you would have him give us. Thank you tonight, Lord, that Trust that each one here tonight knows you as their Savior because these judgments that are going to come upon the world that is lost is unimaginable. Thank you, Lord, that we will not have to suffer this, that we will be with you rejoicing in our salvation. Pray that you'll bless us now, take us home to our places safely, and bring us back again at the next appointed time. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen.